I'd be happy to share this material with people as well. This is not available on the um, web page as it is, but I'd be very happy to, to talk more and share it. You know, your students ask you how you got to their score, you just say you won't die 20. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm the librarian of the group. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so I just wanted to start by clarifying something. Um, when this presentation proposal was originally submitted, there was another librarian from Butler who was listed um, and who uh, might have ended up on some of like the online program. So um, this is for Annie Gady. I am not for Annie Gady, even though my badge says that. Um, she, uh, she's my wonderful friend and colleague who we who miss very much. She actually took an amazing opportunity at the University of Oregon earlier this summer uh, and was unable to make it back for Gen Con. Although she texted me last night. She's very sad not to be here. Um, so just as a note, I'm Amanda Circle. Um, it's my Twitter handle and my contact information um, if anyone um, wants to take that down. Uh, and we can jump right in. So the task at hand that I'm here to, to cover is how can libraries support gamification in higher ed? And, uh, and I'm the newbie of the team. I've played games all my life. I love games, but I haven't um, had as much experience um, bringing them into libraries, so um, done a lot of research for this, and then in realizing more all uh, the different opportunities and options for gamification, I realized I've been doing this myself a long time, actually. Uh, so we're going to jump into um, to this, and the first thing that came to mind for me uh, was library instruction. Um, we do a lot of teaching as librarians, and that's actually where my passion lies. Um, I'm on the public services side of things, so I feel really passionately that information literacy is, is our purpose as a library. It's silly to have a bunch of resources and not have people who know how to navigate or use them or who can use an academic database but then won't be able to do any research on the real world, real job site when they just have Google. Um, so there's a lot of work that we do in instruction and that came to mind first. Um, a lot of times when I'm teaching, I'm teaching what we call a one shot, which is just, you know, I'm invited into a class and I get to work with that class for one class time. And, uh, and that's a whole special set of challenges, uh, but the one shot is a valuable opportunity. Um, we also have a lot of librarians in the field who teach semester long courses. They teach the first year seminars or they teach an information literacy course. Um, so this could be brought in there. Or um, there's a lot of instruction that we can do even outside of class is like extracurricular bonus for those high achieving students who will seek those opportunities. So you know, tutorials or certifications and research seminars that happen in a lot of libraries. So um, one other thing I wanted to note too, um, our library at, at Butler actually houses the Center for Academic Technology, which is um, we don't have a center for teaching and learning, but you know, similar along those lines, they house the LMS. So many libraries are really deep partners with the Centers for Teaching and Learning, and I think that, again, um, leads to uh, librarians being really involved in faculty development as well as teaching with students. So that's another aspect of instruction that we think about. So I think that as librarians, we should lead by example. I think there are lots of different ways that librarians are bringing gamification into their different aspects of teaching. Um, one of my favorite things when I was in library school, it was amazing, um, there was a game called Guess the Google. Uh, it was a, a website that was developed and it would bring up a collage of images and you would guess what search term was used in Google Images to bring back those results. So effective, beautiful. Um, it's, it's not been working for the last couple of years. I'm really disappointed about that. But, you know, a game like that can really um, engage students from the beginning of a class. Um, one thing that I do a lot, especially with core curriculum classes, I have to talk about plagiarism. <laughs> uh, who here likes to talk about plagiarism? <laughs> it's not a very, um, it's not a topic that's very engaging. It can be framed very negatively. So what I have done is I have turned it into a Jeopardy group game. So instead of just going up there and telling them what it is and how to fix it, we address, you know, what are your assumptions? Do you even know what the policy is? Um, what two pieces do you have to cite? Those sorts of questions that get them engaged. So um, gamifying in that way. 
um, a lot of people are um, putting competition and game elements into their database instruction or their search in introductions. Um, I wanted to highlight the, um, I went to a presentation by the University of New Hampshire, Durham, and they have put together a really fantastic choose your own adventure game for their business students. <coughs> Excuse me. And they had a lot of luck with students getting really, really competitive. <laughs> so um, that's something that's pretty awesome. <coughs> you know, you don't cough all day until you get up here. <laughs> um, the second element that I think libraries can do to support gamification is through our collections, obviously. <coughs> um, I know a lot of libraries are starting to actually lend out games. Um, Goshen College here in Northern Indiana has a great board game collection they're lending. Um, IU Libraries has an entire gaming collection tied to their media library. They have PC, video systems, board games, vintage games. They also have a lot of great secondary sources on games for students who are doing game design. And they have a special collection policy for games produced by faculty because they really want to find a way to house and support and store those. Um, another thing that's really nice about this is um, you don't have to be the first library to develop policies for lending. Um, there's a lot of websites and a lot of resources and best practices. So like the first time that you're trying to loan something and you're trying to put a barcode on it, it's really difficult. You're like, what am I going to do with this? How long should it check out? How do you make sure all the pieces come back to you? Uh, but there are a lot of resources um, and a great community out there for, um, for lending. Uh, we can also be purchasing gaming titles. I think this is um, really obvious, but but important too. Um, I think uh, like we use Library of Congress, so it's organized by subject. So sometimes I purchase titles, and they just get scattered throughout the library. I think there's a lot of value in bringing things together so they're located in one central location. So a faculty member who's really interested in this can see all that they have available to them. Maybe even housing it in partnership again with the Center for Teaching and Learning or the Academic Technology Division. So it's really convenient for the faculty to find those items. And, um, and we as librarians can really work with faculty who are interested to identify titles and then make them aware of the resources that are there. I think um, you know, us purchasing a book just because it's recommended on a list somewhere and then not telling anyone about it isn't serving anyone very well. So it definitely needs to be a reciprocal cycle there. And then, of course, we're librarians, so a lot of what we do are creating online resources, right? And actually, instead of just accumulating things, doing that curation and helping people vet the resources that are there and, um, and make it a lot easier. Um, one of the things that I, I just feel so much for the teaching faculty, there are so many responsibilities and duties and just limited time, right? That's what we're here to do is do that support and that pre-work to make their lives easier. So, you know, creating an online resource to vet time and make it easy for them to come across the things that they need to develop the games that they're interested in or the techniques that they want to use in the classroom. Um, there's a really great LibGuide by Humboldt State University that brings together literature, tools, and contact for faculty. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, in that vein, we have created a libguide for our session here today. So this is something you might want to write down or take a picture of. <coughs> and this is what it will look like when you get there. I'll leave that URL a little bit longer, sorry. <laughs> uh, we will put our slides up here once we finish today. and. Um, and also update with any of the links that we've been talking about that we think might be really helpful for you. Um, some of these examples that we're listing, we can make sure that we link to all of them from this page. Any of the links or resources that you show with us? Yeah, absolutely. It's so easy to edit LibGuide. So if there's something that you think that we should add to this, as it's a free and available resource, um, let us know. And we can send this link around to everyone who did the sign-up sheet as well, if that's, if that's easy. So 
Um, this is what it looks like right now. Um, there's some scrolling titles across the top um, linked to a world ca catalog. So if you find the title that's interesting to you, you should be able to find out whether a library near you has a copy that you can get your hands on. Um, it's got our bios here and our um, we'll make sure we put our contact information there as well. And then it's already start to, um, starting to have some resources here and game examples and game designs. And I know one of the resources James is going to talk about in a second is linked from this page. Uh, but, but by building things like this, uh, librarians can really um, you know, be collaboratives and partners in this process um, and make the collections work for the people who are developing games, be it students or faculty. Um, one other thing uh, about the online resources that I think is really important is that um, it's really helpful for librarians to participate in the existing online communities and bring their knowledge and resources there. So like, there's a, you know, some gaming um, communities on Reddit, things like that. Um, if we go to those places, if we're involved, if we speak up when it's appropriate, uh, I think that that is an even better way of outreach and that's a valuable thing for us to be doing. Um, sort of like being like the lone, same person on Facebook, right? <laughs> you do the comments and you, <laughs> and, you, uh, and you do your best to help. So when it comes to libraries and gaming, another really obvious uh, area where we can help is you know, copyright and intellectual property. Um, when you're developing a game for your class, there's so many questions about what can I do, what can I not do, in what settings can I do or not do things, and we're definitely here to help answer. Um, that's a really similar um, paradox to what we've been dealing with with course materials for such a long time, right? Um, what can faculty do in their classroom, outside of their classroom? So it, it parallels um, the challenges that libraries have been addressing for years. Um, but I want to make a very large caveat first. <laughs> Every single resource that you find from a library online that talks about copyright will put this across. Like, it's not legal advice. We are not lawyers. We are not copyright, you know, litigators. Um, we just, um, you know, have a lot of knowledge about this in the context as it relates to our libraries and the materials that we have. But um, you definitely probably are going to want to seek legal counsel or you know, your university's legal counsel um, if you're looking to use the games commercially or beyond your classroom. So one of the reasons why we as libraries are, are really even more um, becoming partners for these uh, copyright and intellectual property issues is because um, all these digital initiatives that we're doing have made it so that we've had to increase our knowledge and awareness of these issues. Um, so many libraries are digitizing old collections, creating online archives, um, and then the institutional repositories that we manage, where we're trying to capture your work as faculty and put your scholarship somewhere so it can be openly accessible for the world and the institution especially. Um, those are forcing uh, us, not all of us, sometimes there are specific librarians on staff, but as a group, we're being forced to negotiate author rights more, mm -hmm. looking at those agreements and those contracts and things like that. So that's um, really making what we have to do and, and what gamers have to do um, in alignment even more. Uh, again, fair use. Uh, that's something we're really familiar with because we've been helping with course material selection and access for a long time. Um, anyone remember back in their study days, uh, good old print reserves, where you go to the library and check your book out for four hours? Yeah, I mean, those are the sorts of things that, um, you know, we developed those systems to help address issues with fair use and access. So. Um, a, a huge part of information literacy, whether you're using the old standards or the new framework, is that ethical and legal use of information. So that's what we're here to facilitate. And um, you know, if you're doing citation or publication and you have questions, hopefully the librarian would be the ones you would turn to. So we could be the ones you turn to for this as well. Um, also, if you're not familiar with it, the ALA, the American Library Association, has a really great tool called Fair Use Evaluator that allows you to sort of put in your situation and, and slide some things on scales to determine whether or not your situation could be fair use or whether you have to worry about things like intellectual property and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, copyright is... Um, 
you know, uh, <laughs> super fun and complicated thing. Um, I think we all know you don't necessarily have to register your copyright, but it, it helps if you're going to enforce something and try to stop someone from using, you know, your work. Um, so if you do decide to register, that actually goes through the U.S. Library of Congress. Um, and it doesn't cover ideas, but it covers their expression for the life of the author in 70 years. So there are definitely a lot of aspects of games that have ended up being copyrighted. Um, but then beyond copyright, we go into just general intellectual property. Um, we go into trademarks, um, which are uh, words, symbols, devices that serve to identify particular goods or source uh, services. Um, so like the PlayStation name is actually trademarked, not copyrighted. Um, the Mario graphic is trademarked. Um, patents, are, um, patents are interesting. Those protect novel, useful inventions, the functional components of things, normally hardware. Um, but those only last 20 years and you have to give a full public disclosure of your, your tool, and then after that point, it's open, and they have all the information of, of what you did to create your product. So a lot of times, people decide instead of doing patents, they're going to keep things as trade secrets, um, which um, you don't have to disclose, but then there's a chance that someone could independently come up with your idea. So. Just in making these slides, I was already confusing myself and getting um, lost in it, and it's very complicated. But um, but you know we are here to help you navigate that. Um, really familiar with the government resources that you're going to turn to, you know, outside of legal counsel. Um, I I was using Star Wars in my mind to help me keep it all straight. So Star Wars cannot be copyrighted as a single film title. Uh, it can be a trademark for a series and for the merchandise, so it's trademarked. But the creative content of Star Wars, the screenplay, the characters, the costumes, can be copyrighted. So that's a, a good example and it kind of shows that you are, are possibly going to have to navigate all of these things. And again, bottom line, not every librarian is an expert. We are not legal counsel, but we can absolutely hook you up with those resources and speak that language for you. All right. I just really like this quote. Uh, the creation of new intellectual property, building on the old, is stimulated as a result of the existence of libraries. I think that's really true. Um, not necessarily physical libraries, but library collections and the access the libraries provide. Um, the last way that I think we can be supporting uh, gamification in higher education uh, is through our spaces and our partnerships. Um, libraries are evolving. There are a lot of different needs um, from faculty and students that we're trying to meet all at once, like quiet study, group study, um, multimedia access. Um, things are, are definitely changing. But one thing that we're keeping in mind when it comes to our spaces is how do we bring people together and bring resources to the people? And I think that that vantage point makes us, you know, a lot of times the heart of the campus. Um, you know, we help foster that innovation and that cross-disciplinary approach. Um, so uh, one example in our library, we're actually um, really happy to be partnering with Jason who put in an innovation grant and was approved to create a video game lab, and the library has, um, for a long time, wanted to be the place where that happens. And I think from the beginning, it was it was uh, you know, expressed that we wanted it to be in the library as opposed to a certain college or discipline because we want it to be owned by the whole campus. So we want everyone to participate, and the library is the place for that. Um, anything else you want to say about your game lab? <coughs> Hopefully, <laughs> finally crossed. get built. You know. It's a place to study the, the academic study of video games in particular, but also gaming and gaming culture. But you know, the library told me to dream big when I went to them with this idea to receive the initial innovation grant, um, and that's just what I what I did. Um, and so we now imagine it as a place that can employ students um, who will help other members of the community design games, perhaps build games, program games. Um, I've already talked to Franny um, and I often talk to Amanda about coming up with ways to build twine games um, 
to, to help first year students think about research, right? And so if you can have students in the class building resources that then the university can use to help other students, to help their instructors deliver that sort of educational content, it seems to me like you you really got this wonderful circuit here that continues to feed itself. What can we do um, for ESL learners? Right? Can we create some sort of gamified experience right? that will help the instructors utilize in their classroom for um, the students who need some sort of extra, extra help? Uh, so does that mean that you're going to add a new level t uh, level two that says <laughs> why they report on the class. storytelling of a video game? Is that a different class? Oh, okay. 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 Um, and, and we're not the first. Um, the University of Wisconsin has a gaming and digital innovation lab, and a ton of libraries are bringing in maker spaces, public and academic. And those are bringing, again, those resources together so that um, people can play and create uh, in the library space. And then just to, um, again, we're at a really unique vantage point in the libraries. Um, Especially at Butler, I'm actually faculty, so I serve on committees with a lot of faculty. I have my liaison areas, but I have a lot of connections across campus. And we collaborate with both students and faculty and, and really serve both of them. So that makes us perfect for you know, being the advocates, the cheerleaders, and the connectors in these situations. Um, and uh, I think that, that was my last point, and I just have my image attribution. So are there any questions? That's perfect because we want to keep moving on and give James time to get us started with the card game. Yeah, and I asked Amanda to speak about intellectual property, uh, among other things, precisely because uh, it's one of the things that I found myself thinking about as I developed uh, Ken in the card game. Uh, recently been working with a colleague in music uh, to develop something, and so I originally called it after my uh, blog and Twitter handle Religion Prof Games. Uh, but realized branching out beyond religion needed something else, and so called it higher ed games or ed games. Um, I like puns, so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is a game that's um, you know, actually been played at a number of institutions, and it really seems to have taken off. Uh, people have shown a lot of interest in it, which is exciting. Uh, if you're the sort of person who uses uh, the library and partners with the library for you know, use of the institutional repository, you know, and so you get that that hit when uh, people download your stuff and hopefully they're also reading it. Um, it's kind of the same thing can happen when you uh, release a game. So this game emerged out of one of the areas that I teach in, but really took off once I realized I connected to another. Uh, my main field is biblical studies. Uh, if you look at my you know, sort of most recent book, you might not guess that, uh, because I've, I'm easily distracted by other topics, um, and I love that Butler encourages us to do things like gaming, but also explore other topics and connections between them. But for a long time I've taught biblical studies. <coughs> I've taught a one semester course on the Bible. And as you'll know, if you have any familiarity with the Bible, that's a lot to squeeze in in one semester. And one of the important things to talk about in that context is the canon, right? So where does this collection come from, right? And that's important because there are lots of misperceptions and bits of misinformation that students will bring with them. On the one hand, there are the students who have seen you know, a graph that shows it as though yeah, it was all set in stone, it dropped down from heaven, and uh, just was handed over to someone, and like, here, this is your table of contents, run with it, or something like that. <laughs> On the other hand, there are lots of people who've read the Da Vinci Code and think mm -hmm. that Constantine gathered bishops and said, you've got too many gospels, pick your four favorites, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you may or may not be shocked and astonished to learn that, in fact, Dan Brown is not a reliable source of information about church history. Um, if you want, if you want uh, an example from my field, from my perspective, it doesn't take a lot of uh, high-tech detailed information to realize uh, the limitations of you know, what he uh, engaged in in terms of research about my field um, in Angels and Demons, which, I mean, I really like the book in a lot of ways, but at one point he wants to make reference to uh, the book of Judges in the Bible, and he calls it the book of Judgments. So that big thing in big letters at the top of the page you know, was too much for him to you know, <laughs> attention to. So these are things that students are often bringing. And on the one hand, it would be great to address these things at the start, right? Because having students have some sense of where these texts come from, how they came together, there is this human story to it, can be important, because otherwise they may be working with assumptions that actually color all their engagement with the content until later. 
And so Bart Ehrman, I put this up there, right? Chapter 15, appendix, right, from his textbook on the Bible, is the canon, right? All the way at the end, leave it to last. And I completely understand why, right? Don't talk about how they come together until you've looked at those actual works. But there's all those presuppositions, right? So I found myself wondering, can I turn this into a game? Something where students could potentially learn inductively, uh, make it fun, because a fast history lesson, even a slow history, but a fast history lesson <laughs> sque squeezed into one day early in the semester is not the way to get students engaged with what I want them to do the rest of the semester. And so I started thinking about this and uh, started going through scenarios and possible ways to gamify this concept in my mind. So when I got really excited about this, when I, <coughs> when I realized that this could be really useful for another class that I teach on religion and science fiction. Uh, I actually have a book out that has a chapter on canon, but how many of you know canon mostly from connection with the Bible, if you know it at all? So, yeah. Well, how many of you know it from like camera company? You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, if you type in canon looking for the game, that's the first thing you'll find. Right? So, right, uh, but for some of you, it's the Bible. How many of you know canon from you know, fandom? Right? So what's canon in Star Wars or in Doctor Who? Right? And so somebody who's interested in the intersection of religion and science fiction, who's done stuff on Star Wars and Doctor Who and Star Trek and other franchises, realizing that could make a game that explores both these things and maybe get students talking about what's similar, what's different, start to get really excited, right? And of course I was thinking, can it have specific card, right? Is Jar Jar canon or not, right? <laughs> and those kinds of things. And suddenly realized, okay, well, I might bump up against intellectual property issues if I want to do something with this, right? Especially since I also want there to be a Doctor Who version. But that's a different company that owns those intellectual property things. And so who would I even float this to if I wanted a game company to take a look at this? In the end, I realized that on the one hand, right, if you want to do something in your class that uses Star Wars characters, you have a lot of leeway under the auspices of fair use. You're not marketing it, you're not going to distribute it, you're just using it for your class, and in your class it would help for them to think about it in relation to a franchise that is copyrighted. You have a lot of freedom to do that in that context, just as you have a lot of freedom to show clips and distribute materials, print materials, which if you just put them online, someone could find that objectionable or even illegal. But within the context of a classroom, there are, you know, there are some restrictions that you don't have to worry about. Um, another thing that was interesting as I was thinking about this is that game mechanics can't be copyrighted. Copyrighted? Copyrighted. No, OK, it's right the first one. Sorry. Caffeine levels are clearly getting low, and I'm second guessing myself. And so that's why you can play words with friends, and it's like, isn't that Scrabble? Shh. Uh, but you can actually borrow the mechanics. If you borrow the exact <coughs> words of the rules, those might be copyrighted, but you can actually utilize game mechanics. But as I started thinking about how do I convey these concepts with a game, I actually started developing my own game mechanics because I realized that actually the, the story of the development of canon is something that is both collaborative and competitive. And there's lots that you can get students to think about it under the framework of either the Bible or science fiction, right? So think about George Lucas in Star Wars. I mean, he's as close to a pope as the Frank.